It all started with the roses dying. Only the one bush at first. The old man had come out to water his garden the same way he did every morning. It was looking sad and brown, leaves drooping and branches hardening. Just the one bush in the corner. But the next day, the bushes on either side of it had died too. Within a week, it was that whole corner of the garden. As the old man puts on his gardening gloves at the sink and stares out of the kitchen window, he knows that something is seriously wrong with his poor plants. The flourishing garden, so neatly maintained throughout all of his retirement years, his pride and joy, is now steadily dying before his very eyes. Living in a small one-story house, there isn't much left for him to do. Out in Bushy, right on the edge of what could be considered London, there is very little going on with his day. Inside the house, he hangs all of his photos of the Lancaster bomber that he and his squad flew in the Second World War. Although those days are long behind him now, he chose to live here because on the hill that his house is on, he can see the planes taking off and landing from the nearby RAF base. And where does he like to sit and watch the planes? From his immaculate garden. The old man scowls at it. The perfectly trimmed hedges, blossoming trees, uniform grass, and colorful beds are all being ruined by a dark stain steadily spreading from the back right corner. Starting with that rose bush in the corner and spreading out, everything in a rough circle measuring close to 15 feet is withering away and dying. Not on his watch. The kettle finishes boiling. He has to use his old gas hobs to heat up the water. The cooker is apparently long past its lifespan. The ignition stopped working years ago, so he has to use matches to start it. If he leaves on the gas by accident, well, there wouldn't be much of a kitchen left. He pours the water out into a mug and starts brewing his morning cup of tea. A few minutes later, the back door slides open and the old man emerges, trowel and cup of tea in hand. Years ago, he would have marched purposefully across the grass, but now he is forced to plod instead. His knees and back are both starting to give out from the years of tending to his precious green friends, but the fire is still in his belly. He reaches the edge of the dead patch and looks down. The lawn isn't just yellowing, it's fully brown. He pokes at the grass with his shoe and it breaks apart to the touch. How strange, he's never seen anything die off so suddenly and uniformly. It isn't just a bad bed or an infection spreading around, it's a clear patch of death where nothing in the given area stands a chance. He steps onto the brown grass and walks to the corner where that first rose bush died. The base of the fence is rotting away in that corner, giving him a peek into his neighbor's garden. With a good deal of groaning and aching, the old man lowers himself onto his hands and knees and peers under the fence. A pair of eyes meet his. The old man yells out in surprise. The person on the other end screams. After a moment, they look under again and start laughing. It's just the mom from next door. She has kids who like to play in the garden on their trampoline while he's working. They'll often talk over the fence to him between bounces. I hope I didn't give you a hot attack, she teases. He reassures her that he's made of sterner stuff than that. Then they got to the matter at hand. What is going on in their gardens? She's having the same issue too. That same circle is spreading out over her side too. Everything it touches is dying. Well then, has to be coming from this corner, the old man says. A pair of them pull the fence apart around the corner, creating a little hole between their gardens. It's short work. The boards break apart at the lightest touch. Before long, they have a little work site ready. There must be something down in this corner that's causing all of this. Side by side, the old man and the mom from next door start to dig. The soil feels strange to dig through. There's a kind of stickiness to it, as if there's a very faint layer of slime binding it together. Could it be a dead animal? That's the old man's best guess right now, but it doesn't seem very convincing. Surely that would nourish the soil with more nutrients. It might offset the pH balance a bit, but not to the extent of… Crack! The mom's trowel breaks. She holds it up to her face, confused. The metal shovel scoop has broken. The tip of it has fallen off, half snapped, half melted. I just bought this the other day. But the old man isn't looking at the trowel anymore. Instead, he's staring into the hole that the pair of them have dug. Down there at the bottom, underneath the piece of broken metal, something is moving. He plants a gloved hand on either side of the hole and leans down over it, peering at whatever it is. Worms, tiny brown worms, each writhing and wrapping around the others, tying and untying knots. He straightens up with a groan, takes his gloves off, and pushes himself to his feet. We need to call the council. There's something dead down there that's rotten badly. 
The woman from Hertzmere Council was clearly not very interested in sending a waste disposal team down when the old man called her. She told him they would stop by the bungalow in three to five working days and hung up. Several calls later, she relented and agreed they would send a team across that afternoon. Soon after 4 p.m., a knock comes at the door. The old man escorts the waste disposal team around the side entrance, keen for them not to traipse any mud through the house. Clearly annoyed by this, the two workmen for the council trudge around the side and out into the garden, grumbling about how they have more important things to be getting on with. The old man chooses to ignore them, leading them to the back corner of his garden and pointing down into the hole he and his neighbor had dug just that morning. Only, the hole is empty. What are we looking at here? One of the workmen grunts. It's a good question. There's nothing at the bottom of the hole, no writhing worms, not even the shard of the trowel. It's just an empty hole. The old man kneels back down by the hole and scoops back the dirt of it with his own trowel. Nothing. The old man hears words muttered that he hasn't heard since the war as he escorts the two gentlemen back to their van. They slam the doors more heavily than necessary and drive off down the quiet suburban street, leaving the man standing confused on his doorstep. The next day, when he goes out to garden, the circle of death hasn't grown. It still looks bad. The plants inside it are clearly dead, but it hasn't spread any further than it was the previous day. The old man sips his tea over the sink and stares out at the garden. It must have been next door. That would be it. Before the council had shown up yesterday, the mom must have come outside and bagged up whatever dead thing was back there and thrown it out herself. Good. He just hopes it doesn't stink up the bin. Now to do the sad part of the task and clear away all of his dead plants. Those rose bushes had been planted the year he moved in. His wife had planted them. As he dons his gloves, the old man feels a wave of sadness wash over but before he can experience it too deeply, he notices the holes. The tips of his gloves are gone, his fingers poking clean out. In fact, looking down at his trousers, he notices a pair of holes on the knees of them from where he'd been kneeling in the dirt yesterday. A knock at the front door makes him jump. He goes out to see the mom from next door standing anxiously outside his place. She's glancing up and down the street as she talks. She asks if he's seen either of her boys. He shakes his head, hasn't seen them all day. He reassures her it's probably nothing. Back in his day, boys used to go out of the house first thing in the morning and be back for dinner. Parents these days are too sensitive, too anxious. The look on her face tells him that he isn't helping. She mutters something about having seen someone suspicious walking down the street, someone strange. No use worrying about it for now. She heads off in the direction of the local park to go and look for her sons. The old man calls out to her as she leaves, thanking her for sorting out the dead animal from the end of the garden. She looks back at him confused. She hadn't touched it. All the rest of the day, the old man stands by his curtains, twitching them open every now and then to peer out and see if the boys are anywhere to be seen. He's locked all of his doors and left the keys under his pillow, but sunset comes and goes. Nighttime creeps over the suburbs, no children in sight. He's just about to go to bed when he spots someone in the corner of the street. Just outside the glow from the streetlights, the figure lurks over by the street sign. The person moves strangely, taking shaky footsteps and seeming to move slightly aimlessly around the pavement, avoiding the light. He opens the curtain wider and peers outside. His eyes definitely aren't what they used to be. He can't really make out who the person is at all. The safe thing to do is stay inside. A man of his age should make sure not to get involved. But the photo of him standing by his Lancaster on the wall tells him something different. The old man straightens up as best he can and walks over to the front door. He doesn't take a weapon with him. He won't need one. He will go over and talk to this gentleman, ask him what he's doing hanging around this neighborhood at night, and if things go poorly, he'll walk back inside and promptly call the police. The thrill of the confrontation excites him a little. He's missed this. As the cold night air blows against his face, he feels his youthful energy returning to him once again. He calls out to the man on the corner. The shadowy figure stops pacing and slowly turns around to get a better look at him. The old man can tell even from this distance that the gentleman on the street is a good deal taller than him, but that shouldn't matter much. He'll go over, have some stern words, and that'll be that. If this strange man knows anything, it'll be that he should respect his elders. The old man crosses the road and stands under the streetlight just a few feet away from the man. Frustratingly, his eyes still can't quite make out the man's face. The old man clears his throat and rolls up his sleeves. Sir, this is a residential neighborhood with young children and an excellent relationship with local law enforcement. I would advise you to move along or we'll be forced to call the authorities. But the sound that greets the old man is enough to immediately do away with any of his bravado. His blood runs cold as the figure in front of him starts to laugh. 
It is a gruff, rasping noise with a slight squelching underneath it. Come to think of it, every little movement this figure makes, there's a little squelch. The laugh stops suddenly, sharply. The figure turns the rest of the way around to face the old man head on. It takes a step forward. Light falls across it, revealing a mass of wriggling, convulsing worms. Millions of small brown worms all weaving in and out of one another, dripping a thick and sticky liquid onto the street. The creature has no face, no features, no skin, nothing. It has the shape of a man, but that is where the resemblance ends. It is utterly inhuman, utterly terrifying. The old man almost topples backward in surprise, but steadies himself. A fall at his age would be very bad news indeed. The creature reaches out a writhing arm toward him. Liquid drips from it onto the sidewalk. A small puff of gas comes up from it as the liquid bubbles, burning a little dent into the stone. So that's what was killing his roses. Fast as he can, the old man turns and hurries back to his house. He doesn't want to turn around for risk of losing his balance. He'll get inside, lock the door, and call the police. They will know precisely what to do. That squelching sound is behind him, taking shaky, inhuman steps to follow him. The old man reaches the front door and slams it shut. He grabs the landline in the hallway and immediately dials 999, the British emergency number. Hello? Uh, police, please. There's a gentleman loitering outside my domicile. He appears to be made of worms. Worms, yes. No, no medication. I'm just myself. There's a thud at the door, then a second thud. The old man drops the receiver and takes a few steps back. No more thuds. No more noises. Maybe that was a slight overreaction. The old man straightens up and clears his throat. Nothing to worry about. A sizzling sound fills the hallway. The door starts to look... strange. Two patches are appearing on it, the paint cracking and discoloring. The patches start to bulge outwards, and a drop of liquid seeps through. It falls on the welcome mat and burns a hole clean through it. The old man's eyes widen. Worms. Just two or three at first, then a few more, then a dozen more, burrow their way through the door, each dripping with that foul liquid. The holes grow larger and larger until the creature has two large armholes burnt clear through the wood. The creature grips what remains of the door with its wormed fingers and wrenches the wood apart. It towers over the old man as it stands in the doorway, its surface crawling and wriggling as its feet burn holes into the carpet. The book hits the creature square in the chest, knocking it off balance. The old man throws another book and another. He knew it was a good idea to keep his bookshelf out in the hallway. He grabs another, but hesitates and puts it back, not the first editions. Instead, he heaves the old yellow pages in both of his hands and launches it as hard as he can at the worm monster. The book smacks into its chest with enough force to break a chunk of it apart. The creature's chest bursts open, sending worms flying through the air. Something red falls out onto the carpet. A baseball cap. A child's baseball cap, half digested. The old man gasps and puts a hand to his mouth. The worms splattered against the wall start to slide down towards the carpet, eating through the wallpaper as they go. Once on the ground, they start to crawl and wriggle back over to their body, reabsorbing into the mass from the feet. The creature straightens up like nothing ever happened. He's going to need more than books. Hello? It's the mom from next door. The old man's eyes widen further. I saw your door was still open. I was just wondering if you've seen... The mom appears in the front doorway just behind the monster, takes one look up at it, and freezes. She has a rusty old zippo with a dim flame to light her way. The wormed mass turns round to her. In the same rasping voice that it laughed with earlier, it says one word. Her name. Then it notices something and flinches slightly, the lighter in her hand. For a second, the old man, the mom from next door, and the giant worm monster all look at the tiny little flame. Then it goes out. The creature lunges at her, grabbing her by the shoulders and wrenching her into a ferocious hug. The smell of dissolving flesh fills the hallway as she screams in agony. The old man does everything he can not to throw up. He needs to get out of the house. The back door, he'll go out the back while the creature eats. Step by step, he creeps away from the distracted monstrosity next to his coat rack, trying his best not to be heard. He slides the kitchen door closed and puts a chair against the handle. It's not much, but it'll buy him a few seconds. He turns, rushing to the glass sliding doors at the back of the house, and reaches for the key on the side. Only, it's gone. Of course, he left all the keys under his pillow. The pillow in the bedroom that's right next to… his shoulders slump. He turns back around and sees a crack of light under the kitchen door. 
A couple of worms are crawling their way under it, gathering together and starting to form on the tiles. That's it then. It's all over. Nothing left for it. The old man lets his eyes wander around the room. That creature is making its way into this kitchen no matter what he does. All he has are a few precious seconds until those worms are big enough to come after him. He wants to spend those seconds the right way. Feeling his ragged breathing starting to find a steadier rhythm, he walks over to that old picture on the wall. Him and his crew, all his best friends, standing young and proud in front of their bomber. He'd experienced this feeling before, this moment. When you know that your demise is guaranteed, it removes some of the panic. The uncertainty of, will I make it? What can I do? Do I have a chance? It's a sickly thing. It leaves you in the lurch, trying desperately to battle against your own nerves. Once it's decided, however, well, then everything becomes a lot clearer. He'd felt this way in the war, when their bomber was shot at while flying over occupied France. They were steadily losing altitude and airspeed as they crossed back over the channel. The seven of them had each taken a quiet moment to say their prayers and look out at the stars flitting above them. Only, they hadn't died. In fact, they were all being incredibly foolish. The solution was so simple that when the old man's rear gunner suggested they just drop all their remaining bombs onto the water to save weight, the group of them had all burst out laughing. One by one, the bombs dropped silently into the sea. They're probably still down there to this day. No explosions. Explosions. The old man smiles. Maybe it's not quite over after all. He looks back at the ball of worms assembling on his kitchen floor. As more worms crawl under the door and join the mass, it takes on different strange shapes. First a mouse, then a rabbit, a cat, dog. In a moment, it'll be the size of a hog. Rushing over to his gas stovetop, he twists all four of the dials all the way up. They whine and hiss at him, spewing acrid-smelling gas into the air. Already his head starts to swim. He'll have to time this just right. He snatches the trowel and a box of matches up off the countertop and goes to the sliding glass door. This is it. Rasping laughter fills the room as the creature stands to its full height, head almost brushing against the ceiling. The old man can feel himself losing consciousness from all the gas in the room. Bang! He slams the trowel against the glass door. Nothing. Bang! He does it again, still hopeless. The laughter grows louder as he hears squelching footsteps behind him. Bang! This time there's a slight chip. He hits it again and again, trying his best to shatter it. But while the little chip grows into a crack, it's not working. A warm, squishy mass smothers his shoulder. Worms burrow into his flesh, searing white-hot pain throughout his body. That'll have to do. The old man strikes the match. Boom! Glass shatters, flames bloom out of the house, licking the last remaining healthy flowers. Burning worms fly in all different directions, scattered across the lawn, the back fence, and beyond. The old man thuds onto his back, looking up at the billowing smoke making its way up towards the stars as the scared worms burrow their way back into the ground. He would never understand the monster that attacked him that night. Thankfully, this is where I come in. There is something about fire that unlocks this primal fear in almost all living creatures, and SCP-906 is no different. Nicknamed the Scouring Hive, SCP-906 is the blanket designation for a super colony of worm-like invertebrates that appear to share a semi-advanced hive mind. The individual worms are dark brown in color and appear to have some level of shared intelligence. When separated from the colony, the worms will crawl towards its general direction but demonstrate a reduced level of problem-solving capabilities. However, once they are back as part of the group, the Scouring Hive is a formidable predator. When hungry, this SCP becomes acutely aggressive, secreting a viscous, highly corrosive acid that can eat through flesh, hair, bones, and clothing alarmingly quickly. Capable of adapting its form to mimic other animals and humans, this SCP seems to find a level of thrill in the chase. Able to parrot a very rudimentary estimation of human speech, it can say names and even laugh, which it often does while pursuing its prey. It is theorized that this ability to impersonate others is used to lure subjects into dangerous situations, like young children playing alone in their garden hearing a strange noise from over the fence. While it can take various forms, the scouring hive is at its most lethal when it chooses to attack directly. Taking the form of a kind of carpet of worms, it flows across the ground quickly, climbing surfaces, squeezing through narrow gaps, and finding creative solutions to stalk otherwise inaccessible targets. It has been known to swarm through various circuitous routes like drain pipes and air vents while on the hunt. 
Once it has reached its prey, it envelops them, coating them in that acidic secretion that rapidly breaks down living tissue into a slurry for the worms to consume. While it is unclear whether this is a genuine reaction or just another instance of parroting, this SCP seems to enjoy gloating at this stage, laughing at and mocking its prey as it consumes it. How a colony of worms has reached this level of cognition is unknown. While tougher than your average garden worms, the scouring hive is not invincible. Susceptible to incineration, freezing, and full-body disintegration, SCP-906 can be neutralized if the need should ever arise. When under existential threat, the colony will begin to undergo a period of rapid reproduction. As long as just a handful of worms survive, the colony is able to rebuild itself quickly. That is why SCP-906 is currently held in secure storage in a 3x3 meter fully airtight acid-resistant box. It is kept at a constant 5 degrees Celsius. At this cool temperature, SCP-906 operates at a much reduced capacity, consuming less food, reproducing at a reduced rate, and moving slowly. Should that temperature ever increase, all SCP personnel are to evacuate immediately and ready themselves to terminate any worms they see with flamethrowers and liquid nitrogen. While this super colony is currently contained, it is unknown whether more instances of these worms exist outside of the Foundation walls, slowly burrowing their way through the dirt towards one another until they have enough to start to feed. If you want to support our important mission while also getting influence over the anomalies we cover and an exclusive look behind the scenes, check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-6698, clean your drains, people, for more vile anomalous infestations. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.